Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Hi, I'm Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Wow, today we're talking with Nikki Chowdrose, PhD, Associate Professor of History and Co-Chair of Technical Professions at Columbia Green Community College. Wow, that was a tough one to get out. This is all really erudite and professionalist, but the conversation today includes... Jean and me, so it's not really going to be that. You can expect some digression. Hopefully we'll have some fun here. We're going to talk today about chicken raising as a hobby. I'm so excited. Nikki's credentials in the science of home chicken raising are equally impressive. Nikki has a 20-year history of owning, operating, and consulting for small farms, and a history of diversified careers in livestock and poultry and niche specialty crops. So she's our kind of people. Welcome, Nikki. Tell us about yourself. We've touched on some of the highlights, but how did you come to be teaching a course on the basics of backyard chickens? I don't know if this will be aired before April, but I I know you're teaching a non-credit course at Columbia Green Community College on starting a small farm, so you've got a pretty big range. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Jean and Tim, and it's really great to be here. There's absolutely never a bad day or a bad time to talk about chickens. It's just one of the passions of life, and I think chickens are for anyone. So definitely I'll I'll take you on a little journey of how I came to be owned by. I always say I don't own my chickens. They own me. Uh Uh-oh. So my journey kind of started when I was 16 and I finally was able to drive my car and I kind of went out on a drive one day, like 9-H on a country road in Columbia County, and I saw just some people outside with their chickens. So I knew that that I had to had to do this. And actually, my grandmother on my mom's side She was a farmer, one of like 16 children in Vermont. They moved to Columbia County from Rutland, Vermont. And I just remember cooking and baking with my grandma. And she was telling me always stories about her childhood growing up with all these chickens that they had on their farm. So it actually that summer uh, after I got my license, I had my wheels I took a drive to Columbia County Fair and I toured the chicken barn and I was just so impressed. I knew I had to do this, but I mean, it required a lot of setup and and a lot of thinking. And I was really lucky. I had horses and I had land so that I could have chickens. And I just acquired a small flock at that time. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that I loved them. To me, they were always pets, but there's so many benefits, of course, with the eggs and just having a routine with your chickens. So that's how I really got into it. And then it just blossomed from there. And throughout my life, I've had small flocks. Like right now, I'm keeping a flock of about a dozen or so, Um, but I've had as many as a couple hundred chickens at one time. And it's always been something that sort of flows along with my lifestyle at that time. So in graduate school, I spent a lot of time with my flock, actually making gas money from selling the eggs to now, you know, it's kind of just I have them in my backyard and we we get enough eggs just for our family. And I will say, you know, just right at the beginning that I've never raised my chickens for meat. I'm just way too attached to them. But I'm lucky that in my life I've had an awful lot of farmer friends and experts who have done that. So I've been around that. I I understand what that's all about. And it's just been a joy for me to be able to take my background as an educator. I'm a lifelong educator. I teach history at the college and I work with our technical profession programs. 
um, to just get people to a place where, you know, chickens are meeting their needs. They can start their own farm, whether it's for extra income or just for a hobby or just to bring simply joy to their lives. That's that's initially how I got into it is something extra to do that wasn't as much work as having the horses. It didn't require as much money to get into. It was something that I could do as a young woman and, and earn a little extra with my egg sales. I love your passion. I think this is great. In fact, I took a chicken course before I became a master gardener and was considering this. Gina's on the other side of the fence. I think she's not a big chicken fan, so maybe we won't even talk to her during this interview. But <laughs> but tell me, I, I ended up not raising chickens for a number of reasons. I was a weekender then. But tell me, kind of, what do you think, as, as someone just starts thinking about it, what are the basics in terms of how much land you need? Do you, you have to worry about rodents? Like, what are the basics of what you want to think about if you're thinking about raising chickens? How do you get started? Absolutely. I mean, I would say the first thing is to do your homework, just like anything, like set some goals, think about why you want to have them. And the fact that having any animal requires 365 day, no matter what the weather and we deal with in this area, a lot of different weather conditions, just knowing that it's a huge commitment that if you go away, you need to have someone who's able to step in and care for them can't just ignore them. But that being said, I think that shouldn't prevent someone from getting into having a, especially a small flock. Um, the other big thing is just making sure that you're able to have chickens based on your zoning, right. um, making sure that your neighbors are comfortable with you having them because from time to time, even the best chicken pen, you'll have an escapee. So those are just some basics. I think after you do your homework, a great thought is to go local. So you have a lot of options as far as acquiring chickens and people can be very drawn to seeing chicks in a box store and, oh, I want to take them home. But that can be a big mistake because you don't always know what you're getting. And a lot of times people will come home and 90% of those chicks are roosters. So that's not going to be like a great start to a flock. You want to make sure you have a ratio of hens to roosters. And so I would avoid like just the impulse buy. Uh, you want to make sure that you have everything set up for them first. So whether you're bringing chicks home or I would even recommend bringing pullets, which are young adult hens first, because that's a great way to learn. Chicks require a lot of delicate work and they can die. And that can be very sad, like especially if you have kids that I think it's great to involve kids in raising chickens. So it can be a little sad, but you know, if you bring your chicks home and they're very susceptible and they, they don't make it. But before so you even, can, can I ask before you even bring them home, like, okay, I'm sitting there at my house and I have, I don't know, 13 acres. Do I need to create a pen first? I mean, before I even go to Agway, cause I go there and think like, Oh, I'll put them in my car and then what happens next? Do, do I need to make Mickey a pen? Mickey drives her chickens around the countryside in her car. Well, that's what I'm, oh. so don't judge here. Oh. Like, I have oh, interesting. I think I saw you on the street the I other day. I have this visual of her in a convertible with a whole bunch of chickens. No, I love that. I love that. But do I need a pen? Do I do I need to be handy, which I'm not? Do I, I mean, like, what do I do? I, do I start, does it have to be a pen, pen on, on wheels that you can move around? Like, what do you need? What's the basic, basic, basics before you even start talking about what you're bringing home? Oh, well, that's a, a really great question. So again, it depends what route you go, because if you bring chicks home, you have some time. You basically minimally need uh, like a stock tank or a box oh, okay. to raise them in with a cover. Okay. So then you have maybe like a month or so to get your coop and, you know, the size of that will depend on what your goals are. But let's just say you start with half dozen mm -hmm. uh, chickens that, you know, are going to grow up. I mean, I think the easiest thing, but maybe more expensive to do would be to go buy one of those mobile chicken pens that are pre-built. Make sure that you have like a good location for them. So I would say if you have some access to shade, like placing that there would be good. Like you want to strategize where chickens are going to live on your property, maybe access to water. So you're not carrying pails and pails too far. You want to think about electricity because it can be great to have like a heat lamp set up if you need that down the road. So maybe on your 13 acres, not putting that super far from the right. house is a really good idea. 
So once you have your location in mind, then, you know, you can shop around. So if you're not handy, a pre-built solution, even a used one, looking in your want ad, looking on marketplace or something for something that someone built and decided they don't want their chickens anymore, that can be like a good first investment. And how much are we talking about? If like, if I, again, is it, are we talking a couple hundred, a couple a thousand, how much for a, for a coop, a really basic coop for six chickens? So they range, but I would say plan on no more than a thousand. Okay. For like a really nice setup, but I would go used and and repurpose. The eggs are sounding this. expensive already, but okay. okay. <laughs> have, you, have you bought eggs lately? <laughs> That's true. That's true. Okay. Okay. We're talking about the housing now. First of all, you're both talking about chickens like they're little puppies or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I don't now, think people I'm grow chickens puppies, for but... raise chickens for other things than just like companionship and pretty feathers. What about a purpose. You should have a purpose because if you want a bunch of cute little chickens and they're running around the yard and they all of a sudden start dropping eggs and you don't like eggs, I mean, you know, you might want to think ahead about things like that. And like you said, you don't butcher your own chickens. So should that be one of the big considerations about what to expect Product wise, from this product wise, see, there's Gene's problem. <laughs> it's not a product, Gene. Come on. What you are the re- what are, are the right. what are the reasons? Pe- I think what you're asking is, and I love to put words in your mouth, Gene. Is Go for it. Like what what are the reasons people uh, raise chickens for besides being pets? Which I'd love to have them as pets. Thinking about the why is part of that goal setting, and I always say. Think about your SMART goals. So if you have no plans of ever butchering these chickens, they can live 5, 10. I've had a chicken live 13 years. So they can live a long time or they can have very short lives. So that depends. Then that also the why becomes what kind of chickens you should get. So whether it's starting them from chicks and then raising them and some people have joy in that or it's looking for specific breeds maybe showing them maybe even if you don't want to eat your eggs you want to sell them or you want to give them to your neighbors that can be an option so i would definitely say they are way less work than a puppy gene (laughs) but maybe a little bit more than a a kitty (laughs) because cats are pretty independent (laughs) okay what about tick control that's one of the big things we hear They are great to control. However, that requires them to have free range of your property, which is something that I don't always recommend because we have so many predators in this area. So that kind of goes back into the housing setup, whether you have them contained in a pen, then they're not going to be out free ranging for your ticks, but they can be a great tick control option. I house my chickens on our farm with goats and horses, and I have a a dog who's trained to keep predators out. So they do have some free range ability there. Some people also choose to let them out during the day and then lock them in at night. So they're getting that that tick control and then keeping them in the pen in the winter is a good option. So if you're a gardener, you have a nice yard, even just the beauty of having chickens around, I mean, they can be very beautiful with their shiny feathers and some people either love or hate the sounds that they make and predators are a big issue right and i think that was one of the things that really deterred me because there are so many predators and i I have a friend who raises chickens south of here and it's 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 always an anxiety i think that you know a weasel's going to come around or a fox is kind of hanging out or so what do you do about that I i mean do you is there a way to fence in your pen or do you have to be out there watching all the time or I'm getting anxious already talking about it. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, it can be devastating to lose chickens to a predator, especially if you're attached to them. Yeah. Um, And it can be a part of, of having chickens and it really does depend on your land. So like I live in a highly wooded plot of land. Um, So we have to worry about predators from above like owls and hawks. And that's where just having my dog on the property like really deters that. Having a rooster can be great because they're sounding an alarm. Oh, there's there's a hawk flying by. And my rooster, 
he'll do this little dance and then the predator flies off. So it's really no issue. But then you have to consider things like coyotes, foxes can be a huge thing. So that's where the fencing really comes in. But I mean, the fencing's not a huge deal as long as you can have some four or five foot chicken wire, string that around. Some people use like a an electric fence, sort of one wire strand on the bottom that can keep predators out. So there's not a one size fits all solution to every setting. You kind of have to understand like your particular setup and then build from there. Okay, now talk about building from there. Tim's got 13 (laughs) acres, and I'm in the middle of the boondocks, but I see chickens roaming around in the city different places. Well, not exactly roaming around. They don't quite have the Along the side of the road, you see them definitely. uh, Escapees, yeah. yeah, but people grow them in the suburbs and the cities, and who do you find out the regulations from? Do you, like, call the dog warden and ask for a referral? (laughs) So you definitely want to look up, you know, and much, much of this information can be online now, Uh, look up your town or your village. I know some villages are actually allowing like flock exemptions of certain sizes. So it really is something to, or just call up your, your town or your municipality. I think the challenge of that is just also, even if it is okay with your zoning, making sure that your neighbors are, you want to have good neighbor relations. Right. <laughs> and then that also brings up another caution with predators. Common predators can be just people's pets. So their dogs or their cats. So you want to just try to like be proactive and avoid any of those things happening that can just make life awkward. We really want people to just embrace and know that there's chickens on a property, especially if there's traffic around. I have a neighbor, it's really fun, who lets his geese roam both sides of his property, which cross a road. And you wouldn't believe just the the wonderful, it it slows the traffic down. People get out, they're taking selfies with the geese. Like, I I love it. (laughs) But it's generally like not a good practice to let your poultry in the road. What what about I mean, again another thing that deterred me was what about rodents the feed attracting like rats and mice and things like is that why you have them on wheels so you can move them around or am I completely wrong there Oh rats ooh <laughs> Yeah I well I mean there's 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 country rats right I mean rats <laughs> I mean I learned They're long ago No I learned long ago you can't put firewood up against your house because it attracts rats who knew right but I mean do you is that a, an issue cuz I always thought it was an issue that the that it attract rodents the feed So this is something that goes to the cleanliness of your coop so you want to make sure that you're keeping your feed the chickens eat feed so they could eat uh, like a layer ration if you have uh, layer chickens and that's like usually comes in a 50 pound bag you want to keep that locked up in a garbage can like sealed container something metal that they can't get in like bird seed right i mean it's the same kind of thing right yeah yeah And strap it down. Like if you're keeping it outside, we have bears on the mountain where I live. Right, right. um, And uh, just keeping your coop clean. So if you do all of that, you really won't have a problem. I mean, there will be mice around, but there's always mice. Right. They're fine. (laughs) They're fine. The chickens are pretty territorial of their coop, so they're not going to let anything small like that in there too long. So there's feeding and there's cleaning and there's obviously watching the chickens. Uh, How much time do you think you spend during the day taking care of them? I mean, it's again, it's like an investment in time. So people want to think about that before they get into it. Absolutely. So I, I find like a lot of people who are into animal husbandry love routine and Mm -hmm. most animals thrive on routine. So my routine is like, I'll get up in the morning let the dog out i'll have a cup of coffee and i'll trek down to the chicken coop and it literally takes five seconds i'm dumping the feed in i let them out of their coop in the morning they walk out in the same order every day like who goes first who goes last it's like gene and me here it's like i'm always (laughs) yeah we got a pecking yeah we do Mm -hmm. definitely i mean this is a well-oiled machine (laughs) i check their water you you don't have to change their water every day as long as you have the right size waterer, right size feeder. I'm checking them, making sure everybody's all good to go. And then they're done. They do their thing all day. I go to work. I'm grading papers. Come home. 
I like to feed them again before dark, give them a little scratch green, give them some scraps of food, some extra salad that I didn't eat. And then they get into a routine. So they actually go into the coop. They roost for the night. I check them over. I talk to all of them. Jean, you'll love that. I, you talk they to your chickens? Beans. She talks to the product, Jean. Is <laughs> oh, I used to doing. talk to the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we and got the three-second delay. <laughs> tuck them in for the night, and they're done. So daily, I mean, you could spend as much time as you want, but right. maybe 15 minutes. But then, you know, I have a routine. Like once a week, I'm going to go in clean their coop out you want to make sure you're collecting eggs every day that can be really bad if you leave your eggs you want to be on top of that you know and then just based on the season maybe you'll do like a big spring cleaning when things thaw from the winter and then in the winter you're kind of just quick in and out and they don't really want to be out as much in the winter either so I, I, so I have still have so many questions I'm, I'm, I, yeah, tell we're me, gonna keep you for about t- a week tell me about the winter <laughs> I, I mean I can they take the cold what if it gets down to be zero I mean do you need to have a heating unit or are they do the, their feathers protect them what's the story with winter yeah so generally they are really well built so <laughs> this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with your goals and doing your homework first because where we live you want to make sure that you do have what we call heavy breeds of chickens so these are going to be like your barred rocks your and they're literally just bigger bodied chickens they're they're hardier they can tolerate the cold temperatures you kind of want to generally avoid like leghorns are light breeds they're a common light breed just only because they're not as cold hardy So you can still have them, but you have to care for them a little bit differently. You can have a heat lamp if it's zero or below. That can be a benefit to them. You do not have to. I think the number one thing is just making sure that your coop is free from draft, regardless of what breeds, what kind of chickens you have. Draft is what kills them. So Mm -hmm. making sure that you have a tight, (laughs) tight setup. That being said, in the summer, it's nice to open up windows and air out the coop. I do have a heat lamp in my coop and, you know, it's a huge factor with safety. So you just always want to make sure that there's no hay or straw or bedding. Your heat lamp's really secure because chickens do kick up a lot of dust. They're flying around the coop to roost and things. But as long as you've safed it, I think a really great something I learned over the years that I was at first like a little hesitant to invest in was a heated water, but it just... If you have access to the electricity to your coop, it really sure beats in the winter, you know, banging out ice out of bucket. And it actually just helps them be more healthy because they have constant access to their water. So with a few considerations, they do just fine in the winter. I don't let mine out to free range when it's like below zero or super windy or icy. Right. Um, But they would take care of themselves. Like they would go up in the trees, they would roost, they know what to do. Okay, that brings a question to my evil little mind. (laughs) You're talking about keeping them out of the drafts, and so the next logical thought is, oh, what do you do when a chicken catches cold or has a disease or has insect things? How do you spot them? How often should you check for things like that? And is there a chicken veterinarian? (laughs) <laughs> so this is this is where some good old time like wisdom comes in into play because I can remember my grandmother telling me about all these chickens she doctored, you know, in the old times in Vermont. So I learned a lot of that from just uh, friends and experts and, and others who have had chickens of what to look for. And there are great vets in our area that are willing Not everyone is willing to see your chicken in in a crisis, but it's all about just quick attention to their needs. So when you're doing your daily check, if you notice one acting a little funny, they can be sneezy, their feathers look kind of dull, they're not eating. You throw them Um, in the convertible and go to the vet? Yeah. (laughs) I have a visual. That's a visual for that, definitely. You you do not want to panic. You want to have a little a little setup. I have like a little hospital bed, I call it, but like maybe a little dog kennel, wrap them up in a towel, get them warm, get them where you can see good, like in the light, check them out. 
And then it depends like what they have going on to the degree of what you can treat. It is all about being proactive though. So catching things early, you'll have a better chance of success. Knowing where you're getting your chickens from, you'll have less instances of sickness. And can I just share a tip that just came to mind? Like for those of you that do have flocks out there, is that okay if I share that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the common things that our, our chickens get like as a common health issue is parasites. They can pick those up just from free ranging out wherever. So just one little splash of apple cider vinegar in your waterer once a month will prevent that from happening. Hmm. I love that. That's great. I'm going to do that myself, <laughs> I think. Yeah, and in the kitchen. I I'm, I don't want to hear more about diseases. Can we talk about eggs? I have egg questions for you. I know I get uh, th- th- one of my neighbors gives me eggs, but they don't seem to have as many eggs or any eggs. They stop laying in the winter. Is that normal? And do I treat those eggs any differently? Do I have to throw them in the fr- refrigerator immediately? Like, how do you deal with eggs? And you said, like, if you don't take them out of the nest quickly, that's a bad thing. New eggs. babies. Get new babies. Eggs. <laughs> Yeah, what what's the deal with eggs? So you'll only have babies if you have a rooster. So just keeping that in mind. And And we need to have a talk, (laughs) Jane. If they're free range, they might be a neighbor rooster. Okay. (laughs) Gosh. And only if your chickens are broody, right, to sit on those eggs. But um, oh my gosh, the joy and surprise of hatching eggs is amazing. But, you know, generally speaking, yes, you do want to collect your eggs every day. Um, As long as you don't wash them, you don't necessarily have to refrigerate them. Although I am a food safety person. So I just say, as soon as you collect your eggs, put them in the refrigerator, put them in a nice clean carton or a bowl. I like a carton because it lets the air circulate. It keeps them fresh for a very, very long time. And do they last a long time in the refrig or, or less than what you'd get at the supermarket? Is there any difference? Oh my gosh, they are so fresh and you can just, I mean, once you eat your own or, or local eggs, there's no going back yeah, to they're, grocery they're, they're much tastier, I know. I mean, they're just, it's a, it's a total difference. And do they not lay in the winter? Is that true? So they do slow down. You can like mitigate that with artificial lighting. So if you have a 60 watt bulb in your coop and you keep that on, they will lay all year. I do like to have additional light in my coop. I just think it keeps, I have some older hens, so it makes them happier. It makes me happier. (laughs) But if you don't have lighting, they will slow down and that's healthy and normal. So they have a chance for their body to regroup and regenerate. Doesn't mean they'll stop laying altogether, but they will slow down. They go through a molt, so they lose their feathers. They look pretty bad at that time, but it's just a cycle. So then they pick up back laying again and... And there you go. Now, of course, a hen doesn't lay as prolifically her whole life. When they get to about three or four, they do slow down with their volume of laying. And and I'm okay with that. Yeah, that makes sense. Definitely. (laughs) Okay. I got one quick question before we close. Who's your favorite chicken? You mean breed or? No, her chicken. And you probably, you do name them, right? That's my question. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? (laughs) Well, I won't tell them that. But <laughs> I'll that is tell wise. You. <laughs> that is wise. So growing up, I had this very special rooster named Big Red. And he would actually ride on the tractor through the farm with me. Love he was this. like really smart. He would do tricks. He was a Rhode Island red rooster. And I did lose him to a predator, which was wow. really sad. He was a couple of years old. So there was no other chicken like that in my life until recently, a friend and colleague actually gave me a a baby Rhode Island red rooster. He has the brother and I named him Caruso and he is so special. He's so smart. He gets so excited every time I come down to the coop. He is the boss over my cattle dog, which is impressive. And he's so good to the hens. Does he ride the tractor? He hasn't ridden on the tractor yet, but you're not, we're working you, But you're that. not saying that the roosters are smarter than the hens, are you? You can't be saying that, right? Never. No, never. There you go. Okay. They all bring a strength to the table. Yeah. There you go. Wow, what a diplomat. Ah, uh, yeah. Not. Well, you got to be when you got a bunch of jealous chickens. Yeah, I have so many more questions, but it seems like we you, there's probably some really good references out there that people want to look at, it, and we'll include some links in the show notes. So hopefully, you'll give us some of your favorites that we can put on 
online so that people can research more? Yes, absolutely. Oh. And actually, at the Columbia Green Community College Library, we have a special reading list of curated books and resources um, that are go to must reads for folks starting their small farm or for raising chickens. So I will share the resources on that list right. and just be careful when you go out on the web. I mean, there's so many great videos, but just make sure you're going with like reliable peer reviewed stuff so that you have the best chance of success. Well, Tim likes to close our interviews with a, a word of hope and it, and it sounds very optimistic. Nikki's hopeful all along. It's like, I know, I, it's you have wonderful. so much enthusiasm. It's great. Really. Well, I've almost, almost, gotten over my traumatized chicken free-range bandy rooster <laughs> childhood. What is what is your note of hope for us at the end, though, in terms of raising chickens? Is it that they have great fertilizer and you can garden? Or what's your, what's your note of hope? Well, chickens are for anyone. Um, they don't judge. They Every day is a new day, a new adventure <laughs> with them, and the sky is the limit. So whatever you want to do, your chickens are there. That is terrific. Thank you so much for joining us. We had so much fun talking to you, Nikki. This was great. We've got to do this again. Well, me too. Thank you so much for having me. Every day is a great day to talk about farm animals, especially chickens. Thank you. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at Columbia Green MGB at Cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 